you know, my feeling is when you say I'm, I'm not really uh, naturally in sales, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more about helping. Well, we would say then you're naturally in sales because that's what, you know, that's what sales is. It's, it's helping, it's serving, it's, it's sharing, it's giving, it's giving time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and immense value. And, uh, you know, so I, it, it makes great sense that you're a wonderful salesperson. Good morning and welcome to the latest edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am super excited because I am a bit of a fangirl of the next um, guest that I have on the show today. So I have got Bob Berg, who is actually the co-author of the Go-Giver series. But more than that, for over 30 years, Bob has actually been successfully showing entrepreneurs, leaders and sales professionals how to communicate their value and accelerate their business growth. And although for years he was best known for his sales classic, Endless Referrals, it's actually his business parable, The Go-Giver, that was co-authored with John David Mann that's created a worldwide movement. There's a whole lot more stuff in there that I want to tell you, but I really just want to share my own personal experience and I'll quickly introduce Bob. So I actually got um, driven towards the Go Giver book by a friend of mine, VJ, posted it on LinkedIn. And I thought that sounds like a great book. I must read it. I read it and was immediately kind of in love with the concepts, the philosophies in there. There's five main philosophies. And so I went out and bought the whole series because there's actually five series in, in five books in the series, I think there is. Um, and um, I was just you know, absolutely enamored with what I learned. And I was talking to my coach, Nikki Baloo and I said oh there's Bob Berg I love his stuff he said I'll, I'll put you in contact with him and this is how Bob got to be on my show today so Bob huge welcome thank you so much for giving me your time I really appreciate it my absolute pleasure what a joy to be with you yeah. So as I said, I came across the books purely by accident. A really great time in my life for me to actually come across them because um, I was struggling with what I what I thought um, selling was in my business. And I had been told by lots of salespeople that, you know, you need to do this, you should do that, you must do the other. And I'm not naturally a salesperson. I'm very much about helping people um, and just, you know, giving – one of our values is actually help first. And so we give without any expectation of return. And so when I read your books, it was like, wow, okay, now this actually makes sense. What I'm doing is not so far wrong. Um, it's just really that I have to, yeah, um, not listen to the people who are trying to push me into a hard kind of sales role. So your background is in sales, is that right? It is, and you know, my feeling is when you say I'm, I'm not really uh, naturally in sales. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more about helping. Well, we would say then you're naturally in sales because that's <laughs> yeah. what you know. That's what sales is. It's, it's helping. It's serving. It's, it's sharing. It's giving. It's giving time, attention, counsel education, empathy, and immense value. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I, it, it makes great sense that you're a wonderful salesperson. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. As I said, there are a lot of salespeople out there or sales training people who will tell you that you have to follow a particular method. You need to do this. You've got different types of closing, all that sort of thing. That's why the, the book was a breath, breath of fresh air for me. So tell me a little bit about, you know, how did you come to to write the book? Um, I know you had a, a previous bestseller before that, uh, which you wrote in the 90s. But just share a little bit about how you came to write the book for me. Yeah. So years, years ago, back in the 90s, uh, I had a, a book called Endless Referrals. The subtitle was network your everyday contacts into sales. It was a it was a, a how to book, um, basically for entrepreneurs and salespeople who knew they had a great product or service. They knew it brought wonderful value to people, but they didn't necessarily feel comfortable going out into their local communities and building the kind of relationships with people that would cause those people to want to do business with them directly and or refer them to others. So, so really, I had put together a system now. Personally, I define a system as the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles, uh, the key being predictability. If it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired result of B, then you know all you need to do is A and continue to do A, and you'll get the desired results of B. And this was one where the the basic premise of the entire book and, and pretty much the premise of everything I've, I've taught over the last 30, 35 years uh, can be wrapped up in, in one sentence, and that is all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And the book was about helping people develop exactly those kinds of relationships. Um, but, you know, again, it's a how-to book, and I'd always loved reading parables because parables are stories, and as you know, stories connect on sort of a deeper heart-to-heart -heart level. And and uh, around the uh, maybe 2003 or so, I 
got to know John. Well, I knew him a little earlier, but I presented him. But he was the editor in chief of a magazine I was writing for, and even back then, he had the reputation as a fantastic writer and um, and storyteller. <clears throat> so I told John about this you know, kind of idea I had about taking the the basic premise of endless referrals and making it into a parable. And would he be interested in the idea? So uh, he and his his fiance at the time, now his his wife Anna, who they've written a book. Uh, That's right. Go so give a marriage. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, but back then the fiance, but but they were visiting her her mother in on the west coast of Florida. I live on the east coast, so one day they took a long drive over across the coast, and we had a long dinner and talked about the idea of this, you know, go giver idea, and. Uh, you know, a few weeks later, he called me and said, yeah, you know, let's do this. And, and that's really how it how it happened. So it took wow. <coughs> really only a few months for us to write the book. Again, John was really the lead writer. Um, and then we were turned down by, I think, 24 publishers in New York before finally one, you know, picked us up. And, Gosh. you know, it's been a great relationship with that uh, with that uh, publisher. So it all worked out. So that in itself is a lesson, isn't it? So don't give up because you, there will be somebody who is the right publisher for you if you're writing your book. Mm. Yeah. So there are five laws in the book, right? So that's what the whole book is about. It's about the five laws that I guess you read about in your first book, but it's told through mm. a story. It's told through the story of, I've forgotten his name right now. Sure. But the, yeah, um, who is really struggling and he comes across a person who ends up being his mentor and actually helps share those five laws with him. Yeah. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about what those five laws are? No, not at all. Uh, the five laws are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. Uh, law number one, the law of value says your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounds counterintuitive when you first hear it because it sounds like, what? Wouldn't that be a recipe for bankruptcy? Give more in value than you take in payment? Uh, but we realize that, of course, uh, price and value um, – I love that EOS cup you have. That's a that's a great cup that you're drinking. You. I lo love EOS. Yeah, yeah and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I know that's your your specialty. That's that's mm. awesome. Great cup. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it's it's understanding that price is a dollar figure, but but um, you know, and it's finite. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, what have you, that brings so much worth or value to someone that they will willingly exchange their money for it and be glad they did while you make a very healthy profit. In the story, we use the example of Ernesto's Italian Cafe. Mm -hmm. It's a high-end cafe in a swanky part of the village. And, you know, if you eat there, it's going to cost you, you know, some money, right? But you, but you feel so great about the whole experience afterwards that it was well, well worth, you know, the price that you paid for the value that you received. And, of course, the owner, uh, Mr. Iafrate, it, it cost him a lot less to keep the doors open to, you know, for the equipment, for the staff, for the food, the cost of goods sold, so forth. So he made a profit as well. So and in, in really the law of value says in a, in a sense that there's always at least two profits, right? The buyer profits and the seller profits because everybody comes away better off afterwards than they were beforehand. Yeah. And so, you know, they, it, it's sort of like when someone, uh, you know, brings you in to help them with their with their business, uh, you're charging them a very healthy fee, which you should. Um, but what you're helping them to do is going to make them a lot more money, have mm -hmm. a much more functioning company, have a lot happier company and have everything. The entire experience they receive is going to bring them in a lot more value than what they're paying while you also make a very healthy profit. So mm. that's really the, the law of value. Fantastic. Law number two. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was just saying that's fantastic. It's a really good way to look at it. And I think that people, I think particularly in New Zealand, we have this whole thing about uh, worrying about what we charge. But if you know that you're actually offering value that has that huge amount of value, um, then the pricing becomes a little bit easier to work Yeah, with. it's not just New Zealand. It's, it's, it's certainly okay. in the United States too. <laughs> And right. I, I would suspect it's pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, so law, law number two <laughs> yeah. is the law of compensation. And this says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number mm-hmm. two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch with the exceptional value you provide, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. So so as as Nicole, who was the CEO in the story, one of the mentors, yeah. uh, as she explained to Joe, the law of value represents your potential income. But Mm -hmm. the law of compensation represents your actual income because it's about how many lives you impact Mm -hmm. with that value. So we could say exceptional value plus significant reach equals very high compensation. Now, law number three is the law of influence. And the law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Again, Sounds counterproductive, maybe even, you know, uh, Pollyanna-ish, right? To put what? Place other people's interests first. But, and yet, you know, this is how the greatest salespeople, the, the greatest leaders, the top producers, money earners, the most, you know, this is how, this is how they do it. They're always looking out for the interests of the other person. Now, let me, let me clarify though, if I may and qualify, because I think this is very important. It can be easily misunderstood. Mm-hmm. When we say place the other person's interests first, we don't mean that you should you know, be a, uh, we would say in the, the United States to be anybody's doormat. I don't know if you have that. that we have that saying, right? don't worry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, 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 it's not that you should be a martyr. It's not that you should be self-sacrificial. Absolutely not at all. Mm. It simply is Joe, the protege learned from several of the mentors, the golden rule of business of sales is as we were talking about before, you know, the all things being equal, people will do business with, refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Well, here's the thing, Deborah. There's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you in others than by genuinely moving from an I focus or me focus to an other focus, looking to make your win all about the other person's win. You know, something I say when I speak at sales conferences, and I often start out saying this, uh, and that is nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet, (laughs) right? They're not going to buy from you because you need the money. And really, they're not even going to buy from you just because you're a really nice person. They're going to buy from you because they believe that ultimately they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Why, why would we expect them to, to do business with us for any other reason? But this is great news for that salesperson who can, you know, have a heart to serve, who really wants to, and, and the same with a leader. You know, no one's going to follow you because you want them to. Mm-hmm. If you're a leader, they're going to follow you because they believe they're going to benefit by doing so. So it's up to the leader to, you know, discover that same thing. How can I add value to this person's life? How can I tie our company mission into, uh, you know, what, what they need, what they want, what they desire, what problems am I helping them solve? How am I helping to bring them closer to happiness and and self-satisfaction and fulfillment, right? So that's why that law of influence is absolutely so very powerful. Mm -hmm. Uh, Law number four is the law of authenticity. And this one says the um uh, most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Uh Deborah who was the the um the mentor in this part of the story, uh, you know, she shared a lesson that was very important to her and that is that uh, that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills as important as they are and they are indeed very important. But they're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic mm. core. But when you do, when you show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel that they feel good about you. They also feel very comfortable with you and they feel safe with you. And why wouldn't they? They know who they're getting. Right. They know who they're getting. We've all known these people who, you know, they they're one way one day and the next time you see them, they're totally different. Well, that's very difficult to maintain trust that way. Why? Because people and this is just an aspect of human nature. People want to be able to make sense of their world Mm -hmm. and this in a world that often doesn't make 
sense. Okay. They want to, to, to feel some type of consistency in a world that's often very inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So when we show up as ourselves, okay, now we're able to really inspire trust. We're able to maintain trust. So very, very, very key. A really interesting a little sidebar here. Um, Gino Wickman, who obviously is the author of the EOS system oh, that I, I help people wonderful. with. Yeah, he actually he gave an, an example that I think is his 30th birthday party. His his wife had invited um, various people from all different walks of life, you know, his family, his friends, his business. And he suddenly realized that he had basically five different personalities at this point that he was to all of these different people. And it was a bit of an aha moment because he realized how much energy it took to kind of be five different people with five different groups of people. Interesting. And it was like, actually just it, he now talks about flying your freak flag and being your authentic self and he says you know <laughs> it's so much easier and so much so much less energy is expended by just being yourself because you haven't yeah. got to worry about thinking about who are you with and who am I pretending to be I'm just being me um, yeah. and I love that and I, I've really taken that to heart because I think that EOS is a, is a, a framework and a system that people think is very cookie cutter and it, it has, it's a framework. It still is actually delivered right. by people. And right. as people, the way I deliver it, and I always deliver it with my elephant, um, is yeah. a little bit different to, you know, how other people might deliver the same thing. So, yeah, love that. Love that law. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, law number five is the law of receptivity. And this mm -hmm. one says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. And mm -hmm. this really means nothing more than understanding that, that, you know, we breathe out, we also have to breathe in. It's not one or the other, right? We breathe out carbon dioxide, we breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving, we breathe in, which is receiving. Uh, it, too often, and again, it, it's not just New Zealand. It's right here in the United States, and I'm going to suggest it's everywhere else. We see giving and receiving as two totally different concepts, mm -hmm. right? You're either a giver or a receiver. We call this the treacherous dichotomy or the false dilemma, the unnecessary use of the word or, right? Mm -hmm. Are you a giver or a receiver? No, you're a giver and a receiver. Giving and receiving are two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. Now, what we know is that the given comes first. This, again, is, is universal law. Uh, it's laws of nature, laws of economic nature, laws of, of uh, human nature, laws of physical nature. We plant before we harvest. It's not mm -hmm. the other way around. We give, uh, we uh, sow before we reap, and we give before we receive. Uh, but, you know, it, it's uh, remember in the, uh, the the original book and the go giver, Pindar, the main mentor, said to Joe, some people approach a fireplace with the attitude of first you give me some heat and some fire, <laughs> then I'll throw on some logs and some, mm. you know, uh, a, a newspaper and some, you know, and light a match. Well, no, that's not how life works. <laughs> uh, we have to give first. But once we have and once we've set into motion by giving value giving value without attachment to receiving, but giving value, giving value to lots and lots of people doing so from the interest point of the other person, right? Mm -hmm. Placing their interests first, doing it authentically. Now we've created what, what John and I call the benevolent context for success. And now as it comes to you, We've got to be able to open ourselves to receive with gratitude and willingly. And when we do that, now we've got a, a really a, a life of abundance. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. And I think, yeah, the, the gratitude thing is really important. So it's interesting, though, because, you know, the, I mean, these five laws, they don't just apply. Um, they apply to everything, don't they? In the in the sure. book, the first go-giver book, it is Joe. It's him and his, his sales role trying to do business. And as you said, he comes across a whole a lot of mentors who teach different mm -hmm. things. And it's wonderful to see how the, the little light bulb moments kind of go off in, in his <laughs> brain. <laughs> but the, obviously, the rest of the series talks about other things, so leadership and sales and a whole yeah. range of and marriage. Um, and yeah. these five laws, actually transgress across all of all transverse across all of our areas of our life isn't that right yeah you know i think universal laws really apply you know and whether we're talking about success in terms of financial physical spiritual mental emotional social relational and 
whatever dozens of other ways there probably are. Mm-hmm. You know, universal laws are law. They're principles, right? Uh, now, strategies, mm-hmm. tactics, all the, you know, I mean, you can apply them to different things at different times and in different, but laws and, and principles just work across the board. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. The, the thing about sort of um, asking for help, I mean, I know that a lot of people, particularly business people that I work with, they feel that sort of asking for help is, is effectively a failure. I haven't been able to do it myself. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? And so I notice with a lot of business owners, um, there's a, a reluctance to actually um, put their hand up and go, hey, I could do with some help here. What would you say to those people? Well, that's part of receptivity. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's part of uh, allowing yourself to receive and, you know, we would say it's a strength to, to be able to do that. And, you know, myself, as well as most people, you know, have had that challenge in the past and had to get over. And, and um, you know, it's the same when, when, you know, we talk about receptivity. Well, what do you mean? Well, it can be as small as, as when someone gives you a compliment. It's saying thank you instead of, yeah. oh, no, no, I, you know, right? Saying yeah. thank you. That's very kind of you. Right. Yeah. And it's actually really interesting is it? because I think, again, a lot of people actually really struggle with that. And um, I was very fortunate. I did a lot of training many years ago about actually um, receiving those kind of compliments. And I'll never forget one day I was actually out on the street in a pinstripe suit, which is actually quite funky. And this car literally pulled over and stopped and said to me, wow, you look amazing in that suit. And I just went, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. You've made my day. And <laughs> and the person receiving that also smiled. So it mm-hmm. is, again, that reciprocity, isn't it? That the, both of us walked oh, away yeah, from that exchange feeling example. really great. Yeah, yeah, because they gave you a compliment. And had you just, you know, probably would have been, well, it would have just shut off the flow. Instead, you thanked them profusely and re- and made them feel good about themselves. So it was the giving and receiving. And now both of you were more filled and had more to give and receive when it comes to others. Mm-hmm. So That's sure. Amazing. So I think it's something to, you know, when it comes to not asking for help, uh, we need to work on it. And like anything mm-hmm. else, if you know it's an issue and you know that you'd be better off by being able to ask for help, then you start working on it. Now, at first, ask for very little things <laughs> yep. and then build on your small successes. Don't just try to go for the big you know, hit, but build on it. Start small, build on your successes, and it begins to multiply and, and add up. And, mm-hmm. and now you're able to do that, sure. Yeah, I love it. And I think also one of the ways I always talk to people about it too is if you think about, yeah, you know, I always ask them, how does it make you feel when you help somebody? And they'll usually respond with, oh, amazing, fabulous, whatever the, the right words are. And you say, right, so if you don't actually ask for help, you're actually denying the person That's the right. ability to feel that way. So don't feel that you're imposing. It's more that actually you're giving them an opportunity for them to feel good too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So some people listening into this who haven't read the books and who might not fully understand the concept might go, but if it's all about giving, you know, what about, because there is a, there's a really great TED talk about, you know, givers and takers. And so if you're always giving, do you end up being the doormat? Do you end up being the person that people take advantage of? What does it really mean um, if you're always giving? Yeah, well, so first of all, two of the laws are about compensation and receptivity. So, Mm -hmm. you know, by definition, it's not all about giving, uh, but we certainly lead, we focus with the giving. You know, we always say that the the basic premise of the go-giver is that you shift your focus, and this is the key, you Mm -hmm. shift your focus from getting to giving, understanding that giving in, in this context means constantly and consistently providing value to others. And, and it's understanding that not only is it a you know, more fulfilling way of conducting business, it's actually the most financially profitable. Why? Because, again, when you move your focus off yourself, which the other person probably doesn't care about anyway, and place your focus on them, which they do care about anyway, well, you're creating that right here. You're creating that, um, that context for business to take place. But let me answer the question because it's a good one. If it's, you know, we're talking about giving, can you be taken advantage of? Well, first, anyone can be taken advantage of ever, whether they're a giver or a taker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it was Adam Grant's uh, book, Give and Take, which, which he did a, a tech, tech talk, talk about. Yeah. And, um, and so, so anyone can be taken advantage of. But I, I would say this. If a person finds themselves constantly taken advantage of, you know, as a pattern, I, and I don't mean every so often in life, which is going to happen if you're a human being, right? But, yeah. but I mean as a pattern, you find yourself being taken advantage of. It's not because you're a giver. It's not because you're nice. It's because you're doing things in a certain way that is creating the environment for you to be taken advantage of. Okay. And there's always a reason for it. About 100% of the time, it's unconscious. 
person's not even aware of it, but they're doing something where there is a an emotional payoff to being taken advantage of, whether it's the attention you get from people feeling badly for you, whether it's an excuse that, oh, I'm not, I would be more successful, but, oh, I give so much and people are always just taking advantage of me, right? Or whether it's not having the tools to know how to properly respect your own boundaries, you know, whatever the reason be, and I'm not saying it's anything for anyone listening, I'm just saying there's always a reason for this, but there's nothing about being a go-giver that is in any way congruent with being taken advantage of or you know a martyr or doormat or or anything like that no yeah absolutely as you said the laws are all about kind of adding value thinking of others Mm -hmm. from a leadership standpoint um you know what can you give some uh, tips for for leaders who are listening into this show right now what would be the sort of the the three top tips you could actually share with us as to where they might get started if they're feeling that they need some help well it's just first it's it's always understanding that it's about those you lead Mm-hmm. You know, it's never a great, great salesmanship is never about the salesperson and great leadership is never about the leader. It's always about those people we're trying to bring value to. Mm-hmm. I think that's the first thing to keep in mind. You know, yeah. it's understanding that you're always dealing with people. Uh, technology is great, but technology is simply a means to an end. Mm-hmm. It's never about the technology. It's always yeah. about the people. And to the degree that as a leader, you can focus on building them, right? That's the degree you're going to become a a, a much better, more effective, and much more respected leader. Mm, Fair enough. Tell me a little bit about your life. Has there been any sort of times in your life where you have felt that um, you've been stuck? And what have you done? Because the book is all about mentorship, right, as well. And there's there's the five laws, but it's about actually um, finding mentors that can actually help you on your journey. Sure. Is there a time in Bob's life that he kind of felt a bit stuck and and had to look for somebody to help? Oh, sure, certainly. And I've always reached out to people. uh, And um, But what I always tried to do is bring them as much value as I could, you know, whether or not I was in a position to be able to do so. They always knew I was making the effort and that I respected them and that I was grateful to them. But sure, you know, there's always been those people who uh, were where I wanted to be. And, uh, and I've just always been fortunate that I've been able to find those people who would, uh, you know, spend some time to, to work with me. So how do you go about finding a mentor? Because you may, I know, I know I've, I've had several throughout my life as well. I'm very grateful to the, the things they've done for me. And I hope I've added some value to them too. But how do you, if you're looking for somebody, you know, to, uh, to mentor you, what do you, what's the, how do you go about it? <laughs> how do you even start? Well, I mean, I, I think you, you, first of all, you, you seek out that person. You, you mm-hmm. find that person who you would like to be. It might be someone who has done what you want to do, or it might be just someone who's had some real success in life that's principle based as opposed to a specific business, you know, type of base. Uh, it might be someone whose style is very similar. It might be someone whose ethics you admire. It might be, you know, whoever that person is. Mm-hmm. And you can contact that person. I think a mistake a lot of people make is they'll they'll contact someone without with whom they don't have a relationship yet, and they'll just say, "Hey, will you be my mentor?" <laughs> yes. And that person's probably much too busy to just take on everybody who asks, and a whole lot of people do ask. Yeah. But and there's nothing that distinguishes you if you just ask that way. But uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't go for the marriage before the date. OK, I would instead, you know, uh, reach out to that person and, and just say, listen, I know you're very you're very busy. If this is something you either don't have the time to do or for whatever reason would rather not, I'll totally understand. I'm wondering if I might ask you one or two very specific questions. Love it. Boom. Now what you've done is is first you've communicated that you respect the process. You mm-hmm. understand that this is not something you're entitled to, but that it's a very big ask. Right. Uh, you have uh, given them an out or a back door by mm-hmm. right up front saying, if this is something you're simply too busy to do or would rather not for whatever reason, I'll understand. And that actually provides you with a much better chance of their saying yes, because what you haven't done is is try to guilt them or make them feel, you know, as though this is something they have to do. So they know you respect the process, you respect their time. You're probably not going to take up a lot of the time because obviously that's something that you are thinking about. And then what you did, which is very important, is rather than asking if you could just, this might be just another American term, but to pick their brain, brain right? So and just, that, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, you, you, instead, you know, you've said one or two 
very specific, specific questions. Yep. So now they know, you know, this is a person who is not going to waste my time. They respect the process. They're going to, they know what they want to ask, right? Now, mm -hmm. you have a conversation with them, make sure you do respect their time and so forth, but let them know how much you appreciate it afterwards. And then what I would do is I would write a handwritten personalized note, very short and sweet afterwards, just thanking them for their time, their the council was priceless. I look forward to applying the information. And if I, you know, if I may, I'll uh, keep you up to date with my progress. Boom, best regard, you know, whatever. What I would also do is I would find, and you can probably find this online or maybe from their administrative assistant, their, their favorite charity and make a small donation in their name. Okay. And it doesn't have to be anything big, but a, a donation in their name that will get back to them. And, and, you know, you're really only doing it just so they know that, again, you yeah, want to in some way be able to give value to them as opposed to just receive. Yeah. And, you know, you might call in three weeks or a month with another question, another. And if they're open to continuing the conversation, right, you know, eventually a mentor protege relationship might develop. Mm -hmm. It might not. That might be the only conversation you have with them, or you might have one or two conversations or through whatever, and somebody else will come, uh, you know, and you just never know. My suggestion would be, though, to approach it like that yeah. without attachment to the results. <laughs> and eventually, yes. there's a yep. good chance you're going to find the person or people who are going to really be there for you. And then you'll do the same, you know, for others. It's the same principles as in the book. I absolutely agree. And I, I love the approach of actually having specific questions. I think all too often people go out there and they just ask for very, you know, I want you to help me. And it's like, well, yeah, how how long is that going to be? What's What effects is that going to have? So I think we're being very specific. And I must say, I'm a big fan of handwritten notes. I, I believe that technology, I love technology, but I actually believe it's taken away um, some of that personal uh, interaction and, and communication. And so if I ever receive anything handwritten, I'm hugely grateful for the fact sure. that that person has taken the time to actually do that mm -hmm. um, and especially the, the the charity thing I think is another great idea is you're showing that you want to add some value back Bob I I, I say I'm a big fan I love the work that you're doing I, I share it with all of my clients um, and you. I'm very grateful to both you and of course to John David Mann as well who's a co-author and his wife Anna for the for the, for the, the go give a marriage series I actually have my husband read as well and it's, it's really changed the way we do things in our oh. in our marriage so very very appreciative um, I love what you do as you can tell how can people get hold of you and the books if they want to find out more uh yeah very easily the best way is just to go to berg b-u-r-g dot com mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, a, I'm a simple man i try to keep things very simple <laughs> yep and while they're where they're there when while they're there they can go to where it says books and they can download a free chapter of any of them and see if they uh like them before they yep. order and while they're there they can subscribe to my daily impact email i send out monday through friday Okay. And uh, yeah, so I invite people to come to Berg.com. Hey, it has been an absolute joy being with you. Thank you so much again for having me. I love what you're doing. And this was just a real thrill. Oh, look, I really, say, I really appreciate your time. And it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. I hope that we keep in contact over the years and, and um, you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.